Well, good morning. It's good to be with you on this Thursday. It's Wednesday morning, actually. This is January 5th that I'm recording this, and this is the 12th day of Christmas. So as we begin this morning, we're going to bow our heads and we pray a prayer. Let's bow. Let's go, go to prayer together. Our Father, of whose love the angels sang when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and through whom we have learned the song of praise, glory be to you in the highest. Accept our worship and our hymns of joy. And as we celebrate the birthday of your Son, grant that in him we may learn to know your love, to follow him in obedience, and to offer ourselves to you in all things, that our lives may show us, too, to be the, your children in all our thoughts, words, and deeds. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. So, the twelfth day of Christmas. It's good to be here with you on this beautiful day. Uh, it's going to be rather cold today, but I think it'll be a nice day as well. And we celebrate that, of course, because every day is a gift from God. So as we gather, we're going to continue our, go back into our study of the New Testament. Today we're looking at Luke chapter 7 and 8 and John chapter 6. Heal, extreme healing and our daily bread. What do you suppose extreme healing is? We know Jesus healed the blind. We know that he healed the deaf. We know that he healed those who couldn't walk. We know that he healed those who were possessed by a demon. Extreme healing, though is the ultimate healing that we receive from Jesus. It's the healing of death. For as Jesus died and descended into hell, and then rose again victoriously, as we pronounce, pronounce in our creeds, did he defeat death. And that's why so often you hear ch Christians say when the, somebody dies, they've gone to sleep in Jesus. Because we know that as Jesus was resurrected, as we are baptized into Jesus' death and life, we too are resurrected and have that resurrection to come when Jesus calls us to go home with him. So let's take a look at Luke chapter 7 and 8. And look, take a look at a couple of the places where Jesus resurrected somebody. And then we'll deal with our daily bread. We're in Luke chapter 7 and verse 11. So open your Bibles to Luke chapter 7. You know Luke is the third gospel in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke. The third gospel, the third uh, gospel of, that is similar to you know, the Matthew and Mark. And then we have Luke. They're all the same basically. They're the, basically the same writings. So here we are. Luke chapter 7, verse 11. And it starts out, and it says, Jesus went to a town, or soon after Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. So in the previous, Jesus was up in Capernaum, on the north shores of the Sea of Galilee. And now he's traveling about 20 miles southwest of Capernaum to a small farming village. The name Nain actually means beautiful. The area, because of its location with the Jordan River and the Sea of Galilee, was rich with water. So crops were rich. It was green, uh, very fruitful. The grapevines did well in the area. And that's where we find Jesus today. And as we read, it says that as Jesus, as Jesus drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. So a man's being carried out of the city. Jesus is approaching the gates of the city. And I might mention here, most of the time, cities back in those days had, gate, had fences around them, huge fences, tall fences, to keep out enemies. And at nighttime, they would close the gates of the city. And if you were left outside of it, you were on your own. Hopefully, by the time they closed the gates, you were inside the city where you were safe. So Jesus is approaching the gates of this town name. And there's a huge crowd gathering and coming out. And Jesus sees a woman who is a widow. I'm sure you know what a widow is. It means her husband is dead. And the, the crowd is carrying a beer. That's what the word says. It was back If we go down to... Uh, let me see here... 
where verse 14, it says, Jesus came up and touched the beer. A beer is uh, like a platform. It's got long poles and maybe wood in the middle. Most of the time it was a cloth that was stretched between the poles, and they would lay the body of the deceased on that beer. So Jesus, so, so Jesus approaches. He sees this uh, taking place. They're leaving the gates to go bury him. Couldn't bury somebody inside the city. They were always buried, out, buried outside in the cemetery. And we read, and it says that, verse 13, And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said to her, Do not weep. It says Jesus had compassion on this woman. Jesus, of course, knew who she was, right? She's a widow. He, because he's both God and man. Excuse me. So he knows that she's a widow. He knows that this is her son who has died. And it says Jesus had compassion on her. Compassion is an interesting word. When we think about compassion, we think about it as meaning that uh, we have feelings for somebody. I have compassion for you. You're sick. I have compassion for you. Your mother died. I have compassion for you. You've lost your job. But that word compassion carries something else with it. It, it sounds like, you know, I had compassion. It sounds like a noun, but compassion also invokes action. If you have compassion for somebody, then you're moved to do something for them. Jesus had compassion on this woman. It says in the scripture that he had compassion on her and, and said to her, do not weep. In the Greek, and you're not expected to know this, the word for compassion is phlogisomai. Jesus had compassion. The Greek word means that he was deeply moved. And if you take it literally, it means that he was moved within his gut. He felt the depth of pain that that woman was feeling within himself. So he was going to act. He tells the woman, there's no need to cry. Of course, a woman whose son has just died, of course she's going to be crying. But Jesus goes up and he does something that nobody else would do. He touches the beer. Now, to touch the beer, that platform that the body's being carried on, that meant you were making yourself unclean, ceremoniously unclean. Would mean that Jesus would have to, if he was a normal person, would have to go and sacrifice an animal in the temple and have the, the rabbi declare that he was clean, the priest declare that he was cleansed of his sin. It's not that he had sinned, but he had touched something that a dead person had touched. And that was the procedure that was taken so that you could enter back into the temple. But Jesus is God. And Jesus walks up to the bier and he touches it. And it says the bearers stood still, the men that were carrying it. And Jesus said to the young man, young man, I say to you, arise. This takes us all the way back to the sixth day of creation. God spoke and things happened. The sixth day, God did what? He made man. Made man from what? The dirt of the earth, the dust of the earth. And then he breathed life into him. He breathed spirit into him. And man came alive. So here Jesus is in this small town of Nain. And he's showing his power over creation, his power over death, even before he dies himself. He says, young man, I say to you, arise. And we're told in verse 15, the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother, and it says, fear seized them all. Well, imagine this. A man says they know he's dead, and a man says, get up and walk, and this man comes up. Well, what do you expect the people to do? They, had, they were scared. But then they fell and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us. God has visited his people. A great prophet has visited us. You see, Jesus comes to his prophet, priest, and king. We talked about that in, in uh, confirmation last year. Prophet, priest, and king. And here he is as a prophet telling this man to rise from the dead. Actually, he's serving the role of a priest as well. 
He's serving the role of the Messiah. Did the people realize who he was? Maybe, maybe not. But he calls this person back to life. Arise. The man gets up. He walks through the countryside. He leaves. You can imagine what happened. He's probably spreading the word everywhere. I'm sure his mother and the people who witnessed this great miracle are spreading the word everywhere. This man, Jesus, can bring people back from the dead. Well, then we move up to the second story of the day. Another young person who has died. Jesus leaves Nain. He goes back to 20 miles to the northeast and goes back to Capernaum, back on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. He walks through, and as he's going through, he's proclaiming and bringing the good news of the gospel to everybody. His disciples are with him. There's also, the scripture says, some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary Magdalene, she had seven demons that Jesus drove from her. Joanna, the wife of Cusa, uh, Susanna, and others who Jesus had provided for. And they're going into Capernaum. And as they approach Capernaum, we're going to come over and turn to pay to... Uh, verse 40 now, chapter 8, verse 40. Luke, chapter 8, verse 40. It says, When Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. Well, we can imagine that the crowd was waiting for him. This is a man who tells us that we're going to be saved. This is a man who can heal us. This is a man who talks about forgiveness instead of punishment. So as Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, and they were all waiting for him. And we're told a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue, so this is one of the religious leaders in the temple, comes out and approaches Jesus, and he falls at his feet. Synagogue. He's a ruler of a synagogue. Synagogue is a church building. Bottom line is what it is. The word itself means to bring together. That's what God's supposed to do for us, is to bring together. We're called to be together in a body and worship. That's why we're called, we come together on Sunday mornings. We come together on confirmation on Saturday mornings. We come together in Bible study during the week. So this Jairus, a Jewish leader in the synagogue, comes out and greets Jesus, and it says he falls at his feet. What that means is that he worshiped Jesus. He assumed a state of humiliation. Jesus, when he came from heaven assumed a state of humiliation. He became man for us. A lower position than what he held in heaven, obviously. Now this man, Jairus, assumes a state of humiliation. We do the same thing in church on Sunday. When we bow our heads in prayer, when we approach the altar for com communion, and we bow as we approach, and then we kneel. That's kneeling before the King, Jesus Christ. A king has two options for you when you approach him. It's off with your head or he will hear you. We have a forgiving, gracious king who hears us, but we still respect him and honor him. So when we approach the altar, we bow and then we kneel in respect, a state of humiliation. This man, Luke chapter 8, verse 42, or verse 41 says, Falling at Jesus' feet, he then begged Jesus to come to his house. And we're told in verse 42 why he needed Jesus. He had a daughter who was 12 years old, and she was dying. A 12-year-old daughter, and she's dying. Well, Jesus starts out, and we drop down to, uh, pardon me, verse uh, 50. And Jesus says these words. Mephobo. We've talked about that Greek word before, that Greek phrase. Mephobo. Phobo. A phobia. What's a phobia? Something you're afraid of. May, if you remember, means do not. So Jesus tells the man, do not be afraid. And then he uses a Greek word, pistuo. Believe. Mephobo, do not be afraid. Pistuo, believe. Believe, Jesus tells Jairus. 
Believe and she will be well. What does he want Jairus to believe? To believe that he has the power, that Jesus has the authority and power to heal his daughter? That Jesus has the power and authority from God to do what he's doing? Believe, recognize that he is the Son of God, that he is God himself. So Jesus tells this man this, and he goes to his house. And verse 51 says, And when Jesus came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter and John and James. Remember, there were four disciples that are of the inner circle, those closest to Jesus. It was the first four he called. Remember, he called him, he was on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and he called Andrew, and then Andrew told Peter, and Peter came, and then he called James and John. Peter, James, Drew, James, and John, the inner circle of Jesus' disciples. Here he takes three of them into the house with him, where Jairus' daughter is laid. Inside, along with Peter and James and John and Jesus, we find the mother and the father mourning the child. They're weeping mourning for her because she has died. But Jesus had told Jairus, believe and she will be well. So here they are all weeping, and they come in, and it says in verse 53, what did they do when Jesus walks in? They're laughing because they knew that she was dead. Jesus told the man to believe and she will be well but he couldn't do it. His sinful self wouldn't allow it. So when Jesus arrives and she's dead, he looks back at him and laughs at him and says, you're a joke. You don't know what you're doing. You know what you're saying. She's dead. What does Jesus do? He enters the house with his disciples and he walks over to her and he says, child, that's that first Greek word there, child, pais, in Greek, a child, the name for a child is Pais. Pais, child. And then he tells her to arise. He tells her to get up. Child, arise. And we're told in verse 55, her spirit returned and she got up at once. And he directed that something should be given her to eat. Well, we don't know how long she's been dead for. Jewish custom says that she was probably dead for at least three days. And here's Jesus pulling her up from the dead. And if you've been dead for three days and you wake up, you're probably going to be hungry. Especially considering she was sick beforehand. So he tells him to go out and get her some food. But he says the spirit returned. That's what that last word is down there, that last Greek word. It's pronounced pneuma. Pneuma. If you get pneumonia, what do you have trouble doing? You have trouble breathing. Pneuma is the Greek word for spirit or breath. The spirit of God entered back into her and she got up at once. Then in verse 56 it says that her parents were amazed. But Jesus told her parents not to tell anyone what had happened. Now, go back to that uh, young man back in uh, Nain, and they ran out telling everybody what had happened. Now we're in Capernaum, or, yeah, in Capernaum, and uh, Jesus tells them, don't tell anyone what happened. Why would Jesus not want people to know what he had done? Think about it for a minute. Jesus came to earth as a man. If they were to see somebody do the miracles that Jesus was doing, and the word would spread, and everybody would hear about all these great things that this man's doing, what would they want to do with him? Probably want to make him their ruler, make him their king. But Jesus wasn't, didn't come to be an earthly king. Jesus came as a heavenly king, king of the Jews, born in Bethlehem of the Virgin Mary, conceived by the Holy Spirit. The other thing was, there were already people who were not sure of this man who was doing this. They thought he was some great magician or something. And they were already thinking about how to kill him. And it wasn't his time to die yet. 
he had work to do. So he tells them, do not tell anyone what happened. Two resurrections. There were others leading up to Jesus' death and his resurrection. And in, his, in our baptisms then, are we baptized into Jesus' death, the crucifixion, and his life is the way we say it. If we're baptized into his death and life means that we're crucified with him and we're resurrected with him. Where do we receive our crucifixion? We receive our crucifixion in Jesus. When, Jesus, when we go into the baptismal pool. We receive our resurrection when we come out of the baptismal pool. Baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Baptized to a new life. A life in Jesus Christ. So now let's move on. I want you to flip over to the next gospel. The next gospel is John. And go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. I've got this section titled, Our Daily Bread. For what do we pray? Our, they go back to the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. So hallowed be thy name's first petition. Thy kingdom come, second petition. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, third petition. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. If you have your catechisms with you, turn to the Lord's Prayer. I'll give you the page number here in just a second. Turn to the Lord's Prayer, uh, page 21, where we have this fourth petition. We pray, give us this day our daily bread, page 21 in your small catechism. And it says, what does this mean? And it says, God certainly gives daily bread to everyone without our prayers, even to all evil, all, all evil people. But we pray in this petition that God would lead us to realize this, and to receive our daily bread with thanksgiving. And what is meant by daily bread? Daily bread includes everything that has to do with the support and needs of the body, such as food, drink, clothing, shoes, house, home, land, animals, money, goods, a devout husband or wife, devout children, devout workers, devout and faithful rulers, good government, good weather, peace, health, self-comfort, self-control, good reputation, good friends, faithful neighbors, and the like. Page 21, you can read it for yourself. Our daily bread. The fourth petition of the Lord's Prayer. So, John chapter 6, verse 1, and it says, After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. So, Jesus has been on the north and the west side of the sea. Now, he's going to the northeast side of the sea. A little town named as Bethsaida. And we're told that a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. He was healing the sick, raising the from the dead, driving out demons. So Jesus is there. And Jesus goes up on the mountain. Now, usually, oftentimes, when we read Scripture and Jesus goes to a mountain, it's not because he's wanting a bunch of people around. He's going up there for rest, for a break, for time to pray and refresh himself in God the Father. But verse 2 says a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. And it says Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. And verse 4 says, Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Go back to Exodus, the Passover, the last plague on the Israelites, where they had to kill a lamb, paint the door sills and everything with blood so death would pass by. This is the celebration, the remembrance of that. So there were probably a lot of people in town for that celebration, just like everybody travels to their relatives for Christmas today. And it says the Passover, verse 4, chapter 6, says the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. And Jesus is up on the mountain with his disciples, probably in prayer, because the next verse says, verse 5, Lifting up his eyes. So Jesus lifted up his eyes. He's probably tired. He's been doing a lot of work. If you go back and read John up to this point and consider what he'd done, what we just read in Luke, he's probably wore out. 
I know just doing two services on a Sunday morning and teaching Sunday school, by the time noon gets here, I'm tired. Jesus has done a whole lot more than that. So he's up on the mountain. He hears the crowd coming, and he lifts up his eyes. And he says to Philip, one of his disciples, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? You see, Jesus sees these people coming to him, and the first thing that pops up in his head is, how am I going to take care of all these people? How am I going to feed all these people that are coming to see me? They need to feed, they need to eat, or they'll become weak, they'll become sick. And obviously he can feed them with his word. We were nourished in his word, hearing the gospel message, but he also knows there's physical needs. goes back to that fourth petition of the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. And that's what Jesus wants to do. He wants to feed them. Jesus, it's written that he, that he said this to Philip. And verse 6 says, he said this to test him. To test Philip, for he knew what Philip would do. Philip was apparently a treasurer or something for the disciples. And what's the first thing Philip says to do? We only have 200 denarii. That's not enough to buy each bread a piece of bread. We might get a little beat. It's a little crumb. 200 denarii. That's all they had. Out of between 13 men, counting Jesus, they had 200 denarii between them. That's half a year's salary for one man. Would have been about $400 to $500. The equivalent back then. Today, half a... 200 denarii, probably around 20 or 30,000. They had 400 to $500 between them. And Philip says, there's not enough money here to buy for all these people. You know, we know about doubting Thomas. Well, Philip was a bit of a doubter as well. We don't have the money for this. And then in verse 8, it says, One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, so we're back to that inner circle, said to Jesus, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they for so many? Five barley loaves, flat bread probably, a little bit more substantial than the wafers we get in communion, and two little fish. Being that they're on the Sea of Galilee, it could have been very probable that those fish were tilapia. We don't know. I say that because you see tilapia in the stores, but... The Sea of Galilee is a native place for them to have lived. So Jesus tells the people, he says, sit down. And it says in verse, verse uh, 10, it goes on and says, Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down. So Jesus had them sit where it was comfortable, in the grass, to be a cushioned seat, not on rocks. And it says there were about 5,000 men in number. 5,000 men, you could probably do, double that to 10,000 if they had their wives with them, and how many more with children? And we're told that Jesus took the loaves. When he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So they had to be distributed. They had to be broken and given out. Holy Communion, take and eat. This is my body given for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Well, they had way more food than they expected. Jesus, it says that he, he looked up, took the loaves when he had given thanks. Who's he thanking? He's thanking the Father. And he distributes them to those who were seated. And so also the fish as much as they wanted. When they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftovers that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. It went from five to twelve. Five loaves to twelve baskets full of food. And we're told this was a sign. John uses that word quite often. Uh, when he uses the word sign... Verse 14, it says, When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. Because of what he had done, they assumed that he was Messiah. The sign, a miracle. It reflects back to Exodus and manna from heaven. 
Remember, the Israelites were in the wilderness. They'd been released from uh, Egypt, crossed the Red Sea. Moses was leading them through the wilderness, and they became hungry, and God provided for them. He provided manna from heaven. He provided their daily bread. I'm going to turn back to Deuteronomy in the Old Testament. That's the last book of the Torah, the last first five books of the Old Testament. Chapter 18, where it tells us a little bit about this new prophet. We're in chapter 18 of Deuteronomy, and verse uh, 15, it says, and this is God speaking to the people through Moses and Aaron. And he says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet, like me, Moses speaking, from among you, from your brothers, and it is to him you shall listen. Just as you are the desired of the Lord your God at Horeb, on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord, or see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up from them a prophet like you, from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. A prophecy of Jesus Christ. And now the people recognize him as a prophet as he feeds them with fish and bread. And yes, this bread and fish came to them from heaven. A gift from God. Prayer fulfilled. Give us this day our daily bread. Jesus Prophet, priest, and king. Verse 15 says, Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. They've seen this great wonder, this miracle of Jesus, and they want to make him their king. And but that's not what Jesus came for, not to be an earthly king. He's their heavenly king, and that's what they need to learn and recognize. So Jesus pulls away from them. And goes deeper, up the mount, farther up the mountain. That concludes our study for today. I really do pray that you'll be with us in on Saturday mornings, where you can participate in the discussion and go over the homework with us. So you're, I know that you're getting this. Uh, we meet this Saturday, the eighth or no, the eighth is that right? Let me see. I'll check my calendar here. Yes, we meet this Saturday, Saturday the 8th at 9 o'clock. And then next Saturday, the 15th, you're going to have an opportunity to practice and use some of what you have learned. You've been working on how to pray with uh, Cindy and Matthew. Well, on that 15th, we have the COVID clinic down at the ECC. And you'll be working down there. I'm going to set you up in shifts to do that work. We'll get that done. We'll take care of that on Saturday and divide you up into shifts. I pray you be with us. May God keep you and your family. Stay warm. It's going to be cold this week. But we also know that God is with us and he cares for us deeply. It's in his name that we pray this day. Amen. Be sure and do your homework. Go with God.